Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. God never ceases to amaze me. You know, in, in the times when we need him most, he shows up just in time. You know, it, it may seem like we're in a place where we can't feel him, but he's there all the time, and I am so grateful for that. Today, we're going to continue in our message series entitled Peace on Earth. So what does peace on earth look like? Is it the lack of conflict? Is it uh, having the right person in a political office? Well, let me remind those of you that have read through the book of Revelation that just prior to the end, the Antichrist will bring peace about into the Middle East and proclaim to be God. So just a fair warning about the whole politic thing. Uh, for us individually, is peace on earth the absence of stress? Is it the absence of depression or the absence of hurt? Uh, we all seem to have our own ideas of what peace on earth looks like. But what does the Bible say? What really needs to happen in order for there to be peace on earth? And more importantly, what needs to take place in order for me to have peace in my life on a daily basis? To start, let's, let's head back a couple thousand years ago. At the time of Jesus' birth, we find Roman rule, laws from a foreign invader. The setting is first century Rome, and Caesar Augustus has given a decree that all the world should be taxed. Uh, Augustus was a very interesting man. It, it is said that Augustus saw himself as a god and was worshipped as one as well. In an article from Theology Curator, it states, In 27 B.C., Octavian became Augustus. This was not simply a change of name, but a change of identity. Although Octavian did not desire to be known as the dictator or dominus, the Senate found that the name Augustus, which means worthy of veneration or worship, would be the way to express his unique status and authority. And he readily embraced this name and eventually became the object of worship throughout the empire. It was not near, merely a name change that gave Augustus his divine status, but also the fact that his father Julius had been divinized after his death. This meant that Augustus would now have ground for claiming, and I want you to get a hold of this, he would now have ground for claiming to be the son of God. Augustus was considered the great source of peace in Rome. He, the, the themes of, of freedom, justice, peace, and salvation permeated his reign. Whenever the great deeds of Augustus were proclaimed, they were presented with the Greek term euanglion, which is translated good news or gospel. I want you to understand the importance of, of what I just said. A man proclaimed to be the Son of God. He proclaimed to be the Savior and creator of peace on earth and was worshipped as such. When his deeds were proclaimed, they were considered the gospel. Does that sound familiar to anybody? This, this was the time in which God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, declared, decided it was time to make his appearance in flesh. The Romans claimed that they had created peace on earth through military strongholds and enslaving those who disagreed with them. They claimed to have created a peace. It was by the government flexing its muscle that, that peace was created. Caesar claimed to have created peace on earth simply by striking fear into the world. But on the horizon of an early Christmas morning, as a newborn babe was swaddled in a lowly manger, True peace had come to the world. His name is Jesus, and his parents had gone to Bethlehem, the city of David, to take part in the census so they could pay their dues to the one who claimed to be the Son of God, the one who claimed to have brought peace to the world. We see in the early morning hours at the time of his birth, the heavenly host of angels showing themselves to shepherds in a field in which they give us the very first Christmas carol when they proclaim in Luke 2.14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace 
goodwill toward men. The Romans claimed peace on earth already, but to the Jewish nation it was anything but a peaceful time. Goodwill toward men? In just a short time, Herod would send troops into Bethlehem and have every male child two years and younger murdered because he feared the Messiah. The angels proclaimed goodwill toward men, but for the Jewish nation, it was hard to see any goodwill toward men. So let me, over the next several moments, take, take you on a journey of the first Christmas carol. My desire is to help you to see that in the midst of turmoil, there can be peace. That in the midst of chaos, there can be goodwill toward men. Point number one, glory to God in the highest. To glorify God means to give glory to Him. The word glory as related to God in the Old Testament bears with it the idea of greatness, of splendor. In the New Testament, the word translated glory means dignity, honor, praise, and worship. Putting the two together, we find that glorifying God means to acknowledge His greatness and give Him honor by praising and worshiping Him because He and He alone deserves to be praised, honored, and worshiped. God's glory is the essence of His nature, and and we give glory to Him by recognizing that essence. Even though the world did not understand what was taking place On that great day, all of heaven fully understood. Emmanuel, God with us, had taken on the form of man and came down to the earth. As Caesar Augustus was claiming to be Rome's salvation, true salvation had come to all humanity in the form of a child. Matthew 1.18-21 tells us, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when As his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost." And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. The birth of Jesus Christ is and will always be the greatest news of all time. Because it was the greatest miracle of all time. God Almighty gifted himself to us so that he could save us from our sin. So that he could save me from myself. You know, the greatest part of salvation is that when we were dead in our sins, He still died for us. When we were unlovable, He still loved us. When we were completely unworthy of His grace, His grace was there abundantly. Jesus Christ did it all so we wouldn't have to. The beautiful thing about salvation is that it comes freely, and when it's given, God gets all of the glory. 1 Corinthians 1 tells us, For God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. When we understand his salvation, we understand that we can't stand in pride and say, look what I've done. That's the way of Caesar. That's the way of carnality. This is the way, when, when we get a clear picture and understanding that when salvation came, it had nothing to do with what I did, but it was everything to do with God's love for mankind that brought him down to earth in order to save his very own creation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. God saved us by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Have you, have you ever done something notable, put effort and time and energy into something, and when it was all said and done, somebody stepped in and took the credit for it? 
How frustrating is that? To do something and to put hard work into something, and then when it's done and, and everything's going well, someone else who had nothing to do with it steps in and takes all the credit. Now imagine... The creator of heaven and earth creating a foolproof plan to save the world. And when he saves people from their sin and he saves them from eternal damnation, he gets none of the credit. We can do nothing worthy of God's salvation. We have no place to boast because it was by his amazing grace that he saved us. And because of this, he gets all the glory. Glory to God in the highest. Point number two, peace on earth. Why were the angels saying peace on earth? And I touched on this a few moments ago, and we see at this time in history a Roman Empire that has taken over the known world, and because of this incredible military feat, there was some sort of peace on earth. Caesar was praised for his acts and for bringing peace, but maybe it was just peace for Roman citizens, but it, it surely wasn't peace for those who were enslaved. It wasn't peace for the Jewish nation who were paying massive amounts of taxes. There was not peace for all. So why the proclamation? Let, let me remind you that, that Rome was not the only problem for the Jewish nation. You see, they hadn't heard from God in over 400 years. There had been thousands of years where God would send messengers and he would, he would speak through individuals. And, and all through the Old Testament, we see thousands of years of God speaking in all of a sudden silence. 400 years of silence. How could anyone have peace if God had not spoken to his people in over 400 years? Surely Israel was at a loss. Tyranny and no word from God and seemingly out of nowhere, angels show up to a few shepherds in a field one night proclaiming peace on earth. What we have to understand is that they were not speaking of peace on earth in the form of everyone getting along and everything is hunky-dory, a, a big purple type of dinosaur, I love you and you love me. It was not peace between men. The angels were proclaiming peace that passes all understanding. They were telling of peace between God and man. Colossians 1.19 tells us, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. It was a foretelling of what was to come, the birth of a child that would soon become the lamb slain for the salvation of the world. His blood that would wash away all sin was the blood that would bring peace with everything in heaven and on earth. The prince of peace had come down to earth. Just the mere presence of Jesus Christ had brought peace that would pass all understanding. About five years ago, around this very time, I was in my home. I was lying down on the living room floor. My life was in absolute turmoil. I didn't understand what was going on. I, I was confused, and, and I had no idea why my previous marriage was falling apart. And so I was doing all that I knew to do, and that was to pray. I, I was home alone, and I was lying there on the floor just sort of basking in God's presence, and, and suddenly I noticed a change in the atmosphere. I felt a presence walking toward me, and as I lay there quietly, this, this presence came and rested upon me, and, and suddenly I was in total peace, peace that truly passed all understanding. I, I, can't, I can't begin to explain the depth of peace that I had. Several months later, when, when the affair came out and, and everything was revealed and I was going through the darkest times of my life, that peace that rested upon me was still there. <laughs> it never left me. When from the outside, it looked like there wasn't any peace to be found, Jesus held my hand and his peace comforted me. That peace is still with me. 
And I believe that it is here now to bring you the same peace into your situation and into your lives. But there can be no peace until we are free from the penalty of sin. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ covering us in order for there to be true peace. The psalmist said it best when he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and see if there be any wicked way in me. He also said, The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. When there isn't peace in an area of our lives, it's time for us to find a place to pray and to ask God to search us and to reveal the things in our lives that are holding us back from having peace in that area. True peace comes from the covering of the blood of Jesus. Second Thessalonians says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace, not man's peace, not my peace, give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. Point number three, goodwill toward men. God has goodwill toward all men, even though all men do not have goodwill toward God. See, the enemy of our soul has gotten us so deceived that we, we believe that God does things to harm us. Have you ever heard someone make a statement, some, something along the lines of, how could a loving God allow dot, dot, dot? Well, loving God has given man free will. A loving God has allowed man to govern themselves. What those people are seeing is a result of man-made governments and individuals, individuals trying to do it their own way. And the result of sin has caused famine and disease and chaos and turmoil all across our world. Many don't understand God's heart toward them. They think He is against them. We tend to think that, that God is far from us, but what we fail to understand is that it is by our own sin that we drive a wedge between us and Him. It is by our own sin we bring darkness into our own lives and we blot out His light. He's not the one running from us. We are the ones running from Him. Ezekiel 33. As surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn. Turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? It's his good will toward men. 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord really isn't being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. 1 John 4 10 tells us. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. We could spend hours reading Scripture that show us God's good will toward men. He is calling us out and to turn away from the things that cause us to stumble. His desire is to be in relationship with us. The divide that we often feel as a re, is a result of our own disobedience to His Word and His command. It's a result of our own independence. The music could come. At a time when Augustus was considered the great source of peace for Rome, he was celebrated as a great Savior. The themes of freedom, justice, peace, and salvation permeated his reign. Whenever the great deeds of Augustus were proclaimed, they were presented as good news or gospel. And as all of that was taking place, a child arrived on the scene in a lowly manger and as a heavenly host of angels proclaimed the very first Christmas carol to a few shepherds in the field. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
It did not seem at the time that any of that was true. But this was the plan all along. Ephesians 4, 1, 4 through 8 tells us, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered us, show, showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God had orchestrated the perfect plan to be the actual savior of the world. As Satan was trying to mimic the plan of God through carnal means, God stepped into the form of man, into human flesh, and came to the earth to bring all people freedom, peace, and salvation. To bring the true gospel that whosoever will, let him come. As I close today, I wonder if there's anyone here that is looking for freedom, peace, and salvation. Not freedom, peace, and salvation that, that a man-made government can give, but only that Jesus Christ can give you. Are you willing to lay down your kingdoms? In other words, are you willing to give Jesus everything so that he can be the prince of peace in your life? 2 Corinthians 6. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. The good news that Jesus brought was his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He showed us the way of salvation. First, we have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he, is, he, that he came to be our Savior, and that no matter what we've done or who we have hurt, that he, Jesus Christ, is able and willing to forgive us. When we understand and believe that, we move to, on to repentance. Repentance is dying out to our sin. Just as Jesus died on the cross, we die to our sin, which means it no longer controls us. You know, it's so sad that so many people decide to stop right there. They believe that all we need is to, to believe and pray a sinner's prayer, but Jesus didn't stay at the cross. So we too must follow Christ beyond Calvary. Romans 6, 3 and 4 tells us, Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Baptism isn't just an outward sign of an inward change. It is absolutely vital. As Moses passed through the Red Sea, we must also pass through the waters of baptism. It is what brings a separation from our old selves. It is what severs us from the sin of our past. I love, I love to tell this illustration to, to people that are, that are about to be baptized or have just been baptized. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that, say, say, Mike, your, your life was up on the screen. <laughs> and we'd be sitting here and we'd be going through Mike's life and we'd be like, I can't believe he did that. <laughs> How? I can't believe Mike would do something like that. I can't believe Mike would say something like that. And the greatest part about it is if Jesus was sitting right there, he'd be going, <laughs> I can't believe Mike would do that. I can't believe he would say something like that because what happens at baptism is, is his blood covers us and he removes it from his memory. That's the beautiful thing about baptism is it, it's not just a sign. 
but it is God himself covering you with his blood that he shed. It, it is a severing of my former self. Our sins are washed away when we are buried with Christ in baptism. But don't stop there. Jesus Christ was resurrected, and we too must be resurrected with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, just as it had happened in Acts 2.4. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And again in Acts 10.44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed at the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. And again in Acts 19, the Bible says, as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hand on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. This is not the gifts of the Spirit we see in Acts that Paul later describes in 1 Corinthians, but rather, as Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. God was pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. It is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It is the resurrection power filling our spirits. See, water baptism is me being put into Christ. And the infilling of the Holy Spirit is Christ being put into me. This is what Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost when, when they asked, what, what must we do to be saved? And he said in Acts 2.38, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and if we are to be his disciples we must as Peter said we must follow in his footsteps today as we stand have you found peace yet is it in the news <laughs> absolutely not is it in friends and family Maybe for a time. Can you find it in drugs and alcohol? Maybe for a moment. The only true peace comes from Jesus Christ. Have you followed him beyond Calvary? Have you followed him to baptism? Have you followed him to the resurrection? Today I want to give you an opportunity. If you feel comfortable to come to the front. If you don't feel comfortable, stay in your seats. But I'm wondering, where are you with peace? Have you found that peace that passes all understanding? Have you been to the water? Have you been to the blood? Maybe it's been a while. Maybe, maybe you've, you've been going through life and you've just kind of been coasting and, and things aren't perfect, but things aren't terrible. But you haven't found a place to repent in a while. And maybe that's where we need to start is a place to repent is a place to seek after God and, and to, to seek Him and, and, and ask Him, where's the peace that passes all understanding? Maybe you have a little form of peace, but, but there's so much more. So I wonder right now if we could just lift our hands and begin to pray. God, we love you, Jesus. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace reaching down to us in pulling us out, God, of the deep pits, God, that we've been in. God, I thank you for your grace being abundant in my life, God, when I didn't deserve it. God, I thank you, Lord, for the love that you've shown me when I didn't deserve it. God, I pray, Lord, right now that you would release peace all across this place. God, to those that are listening online, I release peace right now upon the authority of the Word of God. And in the name of Jesus Christ, God, we thank you for your peace. God, we thank you for your love and your grace. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.